Um, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to uh, <laughs> September the 19th, our uh, city council work session. Um, we really enjoy the opportunity to dive into uh, issues and do some learning into this evening. We've got uh, the chief with us and we're going to be updated on the fire department and some of the up, uh, updatings on that. So chief, I'm gonna turn the time over to you. I know you have a, you. a PowerPoint presentation, which uh, we know you enjoy. Well, I thought that was okay nowadays. I might have misunderstood. No, we love sound it. Effects, it's really <laughs> no sound effects. No sound effects. audio plug. But I can tell you, in an earlier meeting this morning, Kelly and I did count the number of slides. So <laughs> I, I already. Actually, there's 36. You must have got the short oh, version I, in the email. I got the shortened version, the cliff notes. <laughs> Chief, welcome, and audience, welcome, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Council, uh, this evening um, I'm, I'm tasked with a couple of uh, chores. One is to make sure I get the microwave, microwave microphone up to my mouth. Um, part of it is to, uh, since we have a relatively new uh, management team and some, some new counselors on board, part of it is to go back and, and cover some of the, how the fire department evolved into what we are and some of the things that have been accomplished um, already um, with the fire department and some of the um, programs that have been implemented or some of the studies that have been accomplished and then to kind of slide into um, how we have gotten where we are with the ambulance with the budgets and how the budgets work and why they work the way they do and then into current challenges that we have within the organization and current opportunities that are out there for us on, on the backside and, and thoughts and processes. So um, I, at any time, uh, feel free to, to throw a book at me if I'm uh, droning on too long or I get stuck in a loop. Occasionally that occurs. Um, but if you have questions, don't hesitate. It won't, I, I'm, I'm ADD. I can, I can bounce right back to where I was 20 minutes later. So uh, we'll start going through the process here for you. Um, on the fire side of the house, and I've broken it out into the two components for the department. Um, we're responsible uh, for fire and, and EMS and ambulance services. I'm going to focus uh, initially on the fire side and some of the things that have occurred that you may not know are out there and already completed. Um, as the city works through its strategic plan, there have been a lot of um, um, plans and, and work done at the fire department and a variety of other op uh, opportunities. So in 1996, um, our budget, you always look at our budget, our personnel costs and how they're broken out and why they're broken out. Well, in 1996 uh, was when the study was done that indicated the 65-35 split was going to be accomplished within our personnel costs. That was a study done when we had three paid staff, four paid staff and six part-time staff. Um, so it probably is not as current and accurate as if our study was done now as to how the, the, the uh, breakout should be for the budget purposes itself. But that's the reason that we use the, the percentages and formats. And it was based on a work study that was done by an independent uh, consultant at the time. And at Chief, back in 1996, do we have the, um, the volunteer numbers that we had back then on the fire side? Staff? Mm -hmm. uh, in 1996, we had significantly more volunteers than we have currently. Okay. Um, the operational side in 1996, um, uh, we ran a rescue that was mostly volunteer or occasionally a, a part-time paid person with volunteer staff for night hours. Um, our, our response model was completely different than, than the response model that we're running now. The engine was run specifically with volunteers because we had more volunteers for daytime access and response, which um, by the nature of, the, of the, the world today, those volunteers have dwindled it for available for those types of responses. Uh, that was why back in 2009, we readjusted to staff that engine with a paid paid crew to compensate for some of those uh, weaknesses in the volunteer response. So it, the it's still we're still seeking after volunteers aggressively. Oh, we actively pursue uh, market advertise for volunteers. I think we have three or four applicants uh, for this next academy coming down the pipe. We're running about 30 to 35 operational volunteers currently. Uh, some of them are really active. Some of them are not so active. They do are all meeting minimum requirements, um, but at, at this point in time, that's definitely not enough, as particularly in the daytime operations when the challenges on the volunteer side are they're working outside of McMinnville or employers are a little different nowadays than they were 25 years ago. And they're not either not the self-employed can respond still, but the, those that are employed by um, non-local business owners are, are less than likely to be able to be released to go to a fire and go ahead and just lock the door and go to go to the fire. It just doesn't work like that anymore. Right. 
Um, 2005, uh, the, the fire department uh, conducted a strategic plan, and I'll go into that a little bit more. It was um, initiated in 05. Uh, in 08, uh, there was a long, long range fire station analysis completed uh, and identified uh, additional locations required for fire stations. In 09, uh, we adopted the uh, fire response time standards, uh, standards of, of cover which uh, basically um, the ambulance response times are mandated by the county through the uh, ambulance service area agreement we have, but the fire response times um, were not in place. And in this state, there's, it's not a state mandated, but a state recommends local jurisdictions adopt it. We did that um, and that tied right back to the long range fire station analysis that shows because of that response time requirement, we're short in, in airport and north. Um, in 2014, uh, we eliminated the assistant chief operations position and tried to provide funding into the operations side so that we had an assistant chief or an operations chief available for 24-7. Uh, at that point in time, uh, in 2014, we were currently responding with volunteer assistant chiefs um, or myself from home or uh, the assistant chiefs that were available uh, off duty coming in. Uh, and that model was not uh, safe or sustainable uh, for future operations. So that's why we did that. And then um, from 2016 to 18, we've added uh, four additional full-time employees uh, to try and compensate for some of the overtime coverage and staff issues that we've had in the past. Um, the cost of service study, I, we talked about that, uh, but I don't want to we go into it too much. Um, it identified the workload. There's one FTE per shift and all their positions were filled by volunteers and there were some part-time staff. So what they really looked at was uh, the number of calls back in 1996, which was um, a couple thousand compared to the 8,000 we're currently running. And, uh, and, and it was much easier to staff and sustain um, a volunteer fire and volunteer support uh, because the call volume was less and there wasn't as much pull on the, on the volunteers away from their employment areas. The strategic plan in 05 through 07, the work done there, I uh, indicated that there need to be incre increased access to funding. Uh, the facilities need uh, to meet the changing needs of the community, which led to the facility study. Uh, staffing was not adequate for, for workload requirements. Daytime volunteer response needs improvement. Uh, turnover is perceived as a detriment to the organization uh, stability. Probably all these things you've heard from me in the last couple of budget cycles. Uh, so from 2005 to 2018, the challenges that we're facing uh, are very similar to those that were identified by the public strategic plan process that was accomplished by the fire department back in the 05. Um, since then, there were two items that complete, complete a community risk assessment and develop and adopt uh, the deployment standards, which we have accomplished uh, as a part of uh, 2009. Um, the long range fire station analysis uh, indicated that the craft staffing and engine reduced the response times. Um, there was no response time standard adopted. Volunteer engine responses overtaxed with call volume. Two additional stations were needed to plan for in northeast in the city and the airport. Uh, and there was not enough staffing to address concurrent calls. Those were all items that were addressed in the long range fire station analysis. Um, at that time, um, 2008 or 2007 was right before I got here. Uh, the consultants that completed that uh, that study, um, they were looking at. Uh, there were three additional paid staff that were added to uh, address that bottom bullet uh, to try and address um, the ability of the department to uh, address concurrent calls. As we sit currently, um, that's a. a a rendition of our ability to respond from McMinnville Fire Department Station 1, given our response time requirements. And if we're in station, um, those are the areas that we can reach um, within the required allocated uh, time requirement within a six minute response time. Um, as you look uh, at the blue line up where it crosses Highway 99, um, just north of, or just east of McDaniel, um, we can get to that spot just as fast from Lafayette as we can from downtown station one. Uh, and that's because of traffic conditions and um, all of the lights and the, and the, the challenges that we face uh, with the, the downtown core uh, fire station response. Um, we adopted the standards response in 2009. Um, there was community input and council input. And then the council adopted those response standards 
Those response standards uh, include um, six minutes within urban for the first arriving engine, seven in suburban, 15 in rural, and 30 in frontier. Frontier is areas um, in the uh, forest areas that are within our rural district, but do not have houses. So you get up into the up P vine where it's dirt roads and no one living and those types of things are considered frontier. And there's a population segment to, that applies to that. And the right-hand column uh, indicates where we're currently sitting. We're supposed to be at 90%. Large portion of that is due to the lack of uh, substations in the north and east. We do relatively well within the core, um, but still not as good as we should because our, our primary engine is still out assisting on EMS calls when fire calls kick in occasionally and that drops our response time down when we're relying on that volunteer engine to to be the first responding unit. That's specific to fire calls. Um, this is the re uh, first alarm response standard within 12 minutes. Uh, so within 12 minutes, we should have 19 people on scene to have an effective firefighting force. Um, that's specific to residential properties, uh, but at commercial properties, it's 21. But um, as, as we sit, uh, we're at about 50% of that the majority of the time due to a lack of a, a second staffed engine or a delay in volunteer responses. So that's kind of where we're currently sitting as far as our response requirements and mandated requirements. EMS response time standards, um, those are the standards that are set by the um, ASA, the county uh, plan. The right-hand column shows where we're at currently and, and how we're doing with meeting those response time standards. So um, our challenges in response time uh, are specifically um, based on the fire side. And, and um, when we deployed the EMS house out north, uh, the initial intent was to provide a temporary operation just so we could um, demonstrate the capability of a response time, improve response time if we had north end resources and then then move to that next substation to the north. And, and th this is the success in that. Before we did that, our response times were significantly lower and out of whack with the county plan because we did not have those north end resources deployed. So again, with our, uh, our establishing of the, um, the substation at the north end of town, that has dramatically improved our, our, our response time for EMS only. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Um, because we don't have the unit uh, to the north with the staffing of, to put it in, in pocket, we don't have that capability on the north end, which is part of the conversation with Lafayette yeah, uh, as so we the, move in that direction. With the Lafayette, it would help us substantially deal with the north end. Correct, correct. Um, when, in 08, when we were working through the standards of response, um, the volunteer engine response time average was 14 minutes and 36 seconds. That hasn't changed to this date. They, they range anywhere from 12 to 16 minutes uh, in, in arriving on scene. That is our major challenge. The majority of our firefighting force as we deploy currently, um, engine one most of the time has two people on it, occasionally three, once in a blue moon, four. Um, when we get them on scene, uh, we're using ambulance either to cross over in station or to drive and meet on scene. So that's two per ambulance. The majority of our fires, we've had two ambulances on scene. So that's six or seven uh, working firefighters and a chief officer. That puts us at eight or nine for the initial firefighting force. Um, that allows us to deploy and be ready to do what we need to do. If we had to do a rescue, we have enough people to do it safely. Uh, we can get an initial attack line in the door. but. Um, for the other things that require for us for safety or for the extended operations, we're significantly behind the power curve without those second engines coming in with uh, at a faster time frame. And the, it's the nature of the volunteer response. I'm not, it's not their fault. It's that they have to come from home or work and come to the station, then get in the rig and wait for everyone for and then go out the door. Ambulance. 1983, first three paid staff were added to the staff ambulance. Uh, Chief Schultz was the fourth one. He doesn't like to advertise that. That was a year or two later. I, I know he's in the audience back here. I want to give him some credit for being in the history of the department. Um, uh, he, turned, he turned red. <laughs> in 2002, um, the new Medicare fee schedules came out from the federal government. Uh, prior to 2002, uh, when we talk about ambulance budget and ambulances, the fee schedule was built in 93, how we split our, our ambulance dollars, why we did the issues we did with um, the split, the 65-35 on the personnel costs. Uh, and, and in 2002, Medicare did a five-year revision on their, their plan. Um, in 2004, 
uh, as a result of that revision, the first property tax transfer started occurring into the ambulance fund out of what was at that time the fire fund, but it was still general fund taxes just allocated into a different, different fund um, back in those days. Um, 2004, uh, we got the ASA awarded to the McMinnville Fire Department and went into contract for services with the county. Even though we have been providing ambulance service uh, since the 50s, 40s, um, the, the, um, the state process of, of giving authority to the county and then the county developing the plan and the ASA contracts uh, went into official uh, capacity in 2004. In 2009, uh, and I'll get into this a little bit later, uh, we did a self-assessment process and identified ambulance service options and should we keep ambulance, should we get rid of ambulance, is it important to us, is it not important to us as a community? And it was a year and a half long option and lots of PowerPoints uh, at that point in time. That was when I was waved off the PowerPoints. So we're back to PowerPoints now. Um, in 2011, a decision was made by council based off of those, uh, both the public input and the, and the processes we have gone through. Um, that was when the decision was made to establish the Baker Creek substation, move an ambulance out there, increase, convert some uh, part-time positions to full-time, and uh, increase our staffing levels to three full-time ambulances. Uh, and that's why 13, 14, we talk about that. And then um, in 2014, um, the um, ACA added about 9,000 Medicare recipients in Yamhill County, um, our Medicaid recipients in Yamhill County. As a result of that increase in Medicaid recipients, our call volume uh, significantly jumped through those three years of those incremental increases in, in the Medicaid uh, recipients within Yamhill County. Um, during the EMS challenge presentation, we talked about rapid response critical. It's important that we get there on scene. Um, time is, is muscle. If the heart is having a heart attack or you're having strokes, every minute counts. And there's a lot of, lot of things uh, that were going on uh, in the demonstration of, the, of the, uh, our inability at the time to meet the response time standards for the ASA. Uh, 10 and 11, uh, the ambulance budget had a $500,000 uh, transfer in from general fund support. Just kind of a, that's your marker to, as we go through the rest of this process. Uh, Chief, during that EMS uh, challenge presentation in 2009, w was that the time we were looking at uh, the possibility of going to a third party vendor? That's correct. Okay, that's and correct. we had that whole discussion. We went quite a ways down. That's correct. And then you really fine tuned and uh, changed things around so that we felt we could have more control, better service uh, than having a third party. Correct. Client. Okay, that's correct. Hey, Chief, um, Chief, I sorry. Have just a quick one. Yes, sir. Uh, on the preceding one up there. Yes, sir. Uh, next one. Oh. Uh, what, PT plus a part time. Part time plus, plus positions. Those were those were twelve hour employees. Twelve converted hour. to forty uh, twenty four hour employees. We had six of them at the time. So uh, the qual uh, part time plus is. Say again. Uh, they're they're a uh, they're an employee uh, gr group that uh, is not full time, uh, but that but they worked they were working. We had six two part time plus per shift, so they were working uh, twelve hour days. Twelve hours. Right. So we had a we had a twelve hour day car or a peak car on Monday through Friday. I see. Okay. And then as a result of that change and the and the council uh, move to. Um, us keep ambulance in house. We converted them to 24 hour full time positions, and that car went from a 12 hour car to a 24 hour car. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. This was some of the the delays that we were occurring that the council was making decisions off some of the issues that we were faced with um, at that point in time. The delays and the, the difficulty breathing, the chest calls, uh, chest pain calls, um, and then uh, we were struggling to meet the county response time uh, requirements. Um, that is where we were at the time. I showed you where we are currently. Um, we were significantly below the, the standards that the county had placed on us. So we had to do something to try and improve um, our, our response time requirements at that time uh, to try and uh, meet those requirements. We had an obligation to either uh, put up or get out of the business and that was, that was what we were struggling with. Uh, we talked about three primary methods. Uh, one was all fire department staff, one was uh, some staff, some contract, and one was contract most. Um, we, we went down the road of, of contract most, uh, which was similar to the Salem model when they contracted with um, the private ambulance when they first moved into that, that contract with them. Um, common advantages to all of them. Um, there's a cost associated with all of them, but the common advantage to all of them was improving response times, improving firefighter safety, 
Um, there was the downside was there was additional funding required for all options. And no matter what we did, whether we contracted out or we kept it ourselves, there was going to be an additional requirement uh, of funding for us to do that. Um, that were those were the models that we were looking at. Um, and those were the comparables the council was using to make the decisions that they they made back in the the time when those decisions were made. Even if we if we gave up the franchise completely, um, we would have had only been funding to handle nine firefighters um, on the shift. And given where we were and where we are, that's that's not a sustainable firefighting force. Um, so that that kind of lets you see that the the ambulance service, while um, uh, there's some costs associated with running an ambulance service. And the way it's run currently within our department, it, it enhances the firefighting operations also and reduces the overall general fund contributions to what would be a sustainable firefighter force if we got rid of the ambulance. Um, when the ASA ordinance was written, um, the, the Yamhill County group, the ASA committee, the commissioners, all understood um, the importance of um, the ambulance service and the revenues from the ambulance service helping augment um, the general funds of the municipalities that were providing ambulance service. So it was even written into the ordinance as a, as a measure of um, uh, a benchmark for the reasons the, the, the plan and the ordinance were laid out the way they were. Then we decided to, uh, the council made the decision to, to keep the EMS service and expand the services internally, um, partially because of a large outcry from citizens about the concern of going to a private ambulance, partially because of a large outcry of partners, and partially because of the costs associated <laughs> with moving forward in the other methods. Um, so we decided to keep the service. We rented station 12. We added uh, Chief Mount as an EMS chief. And we converted those six part-time employees to six full-time employees to staff that third 24-hour ambulance. Uh, since that time, uh, three staff have been added to reduce mandatory overtime in 1617. We've added Amity contracts with a day car for two part-time employees Monday through Friday. We've restructured the battalion chief. Uh, we've added a 24-hour firefighter in 1819 this year uh, to help cover vacancies, and we'll be adding one admin FTE in January to reduce the overtime hours or after hours work up by the operations staff. Those are some of the things that we're working on or in the mix or in the budget this year. I placed a, a budget on your tabletop. Um, and the whole concept behind this is uh, just for those of you that aren't familiar with um, what our budget would look like if we were a joint budget or if what our budget would look like if we uh, didn't have ambulance service. Um, the fire and ambulance columns are what my two budgets currently read within this year's budget. The combined budget is basically just the addition of those two budgets together. And then the right-hand column is adjusting those budgets if we were to not have an ambulance service, but still we're trying to meet our firefighting responsibilities. And on the very last page of that budget, um, on the right-hand column in the very bottom, it would require $1.1 million in general fund to staff the fire department so we could have a response that was adequate to meet uh, an engine and a rescue and a battalion chief. Uh, that's six, seven people per shift, nine people. I don't know how many people per shift. So that last, on that last column in the last line, we have net, and then that 1.1 would be the additional that we would need to put in if we only did fire. Correct. Compared to what we're putting Com in today. Compared to what we're putting in today. Okay. Right. So the, so the. To maintain well, so what that would do, that would give us one engine, as we currently have, uh, one battalion chief that we currently have, and one rescue, because there's no way that one engine can work in partnership with a private ambulance company by themselves and, and EMS assist all the calls that occur within the city limits. So we would have to have a, a what's called a rescue or a staffed ambulance, but it's not an ambulance. It's specifically designed to provide that EMS support on EMS calls. Chief, did I see the the numbers on the full time employees who dropped from thirty one to nine? Is that correct? and that was if we got rid of ambulance completely yeah. and didn't do any kind of adjustment to compensate for the revenue loss? Okay, and that was back in two thousand eight or nine. That 
those numbers from that were from that year? That was from that year, correct, okay. correct. These numbers are from this year's budget um, as we have budgeted. So that the the purpose behind that was just to kind of show that if we if the 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 way that even though our budget looks like uh, ambulances drawing general fund dollars down to help keep it running, it's almost opposite that the, the re revenues from the ambulances really are helping sustain the firefighting operations. Um, we'd have to we'd have to dip deeper without the ambulance services to maintain fire. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then and that, quite frankly, is really the, the lowest level of fire that you would even want that, to yeah. think about um, because you, we wouldn't have the ambulance people being able to respond and assist on the fire. You wouldn't have that crossover there. Correct. Correct. Um, the ambulance revenue covers 52% uh, of our, our operating, our joint operating costs, similar departments uh, that are operating fire and EMS combined uh, are in the mid 40s. Uh, they're under the 50% range significantly. So um, our, it's not the f for lack of collections uh, that are the, the challenge. It's really, it really is providing a, a sustainable revenue source uh, into the future as, as, as we move forward. Um, ambulance revenues. Um, so, uh, Councilor Peralta asked me a couple of questions uh, a couple of meetings ago, and I kind of had to do some digging and do some number crunching to kind of come up with some answers. And I understand the question, and I'm not. I'm not I wanted, but I wanted to give you an answer as to the types of revenues that we're talking about. The question was uh, specific to the ambulance responses into the rural districts that are not paying property tax. Um, we cover uh, 450 square miles, as you're all familiar with. We cover uh, Ga uh, Gaston and Yamhill and Carlton and Lafayette. And so those departments, um, unlike our own rural district who contribute general fund dollars, th those other departments do not. Um, so what was the, what was the, the what were we really bringing in? What was the what was the benefit? What was the risk associated with that? So um, we run uh, we collected, and that number is not accurate because I I misadded on my my ten key. It's actually five hundred sixty thousand dollars in two thousand seventeen um, on seven hundred and forty one transports. Um, so. That's close to six hundred thousand dollars, and in my simple world, that's like one twenty-four hour ambulance, is staffing for one twenty-four hour ambulance. Yet they're only running a thousand calls when all of our other ambulance, all of our ambulances are running twenty-three hundred calls. So, <clears throat> funding from those rural districts pays for a twenty-four hour ambulance, uh, but only uses it half the time. So there is some benefit uh, to the city in providing those services. Um, that, that those revenues that are coming in from the rural districts and um, our uh, rural district um, that the, when I say rural district again I'm not speaking McMinnville rural district but I'm speaking um, the other rural districts um, the, their average return is about seven hundred and sixty five dollars a call our in-city returns are about six hundred and ninety dollars a call so there's a a little bit of an increase in uptick on the rural district return per call that does not meet the twelve hundred dollar cost per call which I know was part of the conversation, but at the end of the day, when you look at the the the, the overall um, revenue from those departments and the use of the unit, there is an advantage to the city to be paying for half of a car that is a, is working on on uh, those those types of things that's funded by another district. Or so other again, you say in city uh, about six ninety. Five fifty-one twenty-seven was the number of in-city transports. Right, sorry, from, uh, a from a dollar. From a dollar. Six ninety. Yes, I'm sorry. Six ninety, yeah. and then yeah. out of city, we're 765. getting about seven. Sixty-five. Sixty-five. Okay. Thank you. And again, that that's not. I mean, the, those numbers. Our return on Medicare and Medicaid is significantly lower, right. and so that. But that's the 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 average that I can pull out of the. Okay. Um, we talked about that already, so I don't want to uh, be a dead horse, but that is the... Yeah, can I, can I stop just for a sure. moment? Um, if my recollection, uh, are there some accounting changes in uh, what Medicaid or Medicare is going to be giving us back in 2019? Is there a bump in, in uh, their 
ability to cover a little more of services provided? Correct. Medicaid. Medicaid. Um, the the Tualatin Valley uh, took the lead on applying for uh, ground emergency medical transport uh, subsidy from okay. the federal government. Um, it was it was submitted and and uh, returned and then resubmitted to the federal government. It came back with final approval approval. So the state of an Oregon is approved for the Medicaid subsidy. Um, as considered as a provider, uh, just like hospitals are. Um, what that does for us, um, uh, so the next step in the process is DHS will take, and I, the term is SPA, but, and maybe Sal can help me with what that means, but it's a document that's going to be the living document of, of how we get refunded the, those, those dollars. Um, the Department of Health and Social Services, or DHS, the, the EMS falls under, will be working on the, the language for um, and putting the training roadshow together to come out and teach uh, the, those of us that are eligible for those reimbursements how to apply, what we have to do. We will have to register just like we have to do for the insurance companies uh, as a provider and, and how to get a provider number and give our Medicaid numbers and all of our Medicaid information will transfer over. Um, and then the, the goal of that is to reimburse 50% um, of the difference between the cost our cost per call, not our charge, but our cost per call and the amount we were reimbursed from Medicaid. So if Medicaid reimburses us, let's just use flat numbers because it's easier for simple, right. simple folk like me. If Medicaid, if we, if we bill $1,800, um, Medicaid reimburses us $400. Our actual cost is $1,200 per call. They'll give us 50% of the difference between 400 and 1200. Between 400 and 1200. And, and just to confirm that in the last two budgets, that was about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars each each year. Roughly. That's correct. That's correct. And there is a retro date, but I have not seen the final documentation. Uh, it is supposed to go back into last year, but I don't know how far back into last year. So that that is going to then become an ongoing revenue stream. Correct. For us. Correct. Um, that is a that is a, a mechanism for reimbursement for Medicaid um, uh, um, shortages, for lack sure. of a better term. Sure. That has been in place for many years, and only recently has the ambulance service, um, uh, municipal fire-based ambulance services, started to uh, gain access to those pull, dollars. Pull on that California, Texas, um, us. There's there's only five or six states that have actually gone through the hoops to to get to that point, but. We are one of them, and we will be um, recouping some of those funds in the not-too-distant future. Is, is it too early, and, and, and Sal just gave us some insight, but is it too early for us to, well, two questions. Number one, when we make application, do we see that being uh, available for all of 2019, or is it more appropriate to say for fiscal 2019 we will have those reimbursements? No, the original uh, conversations and, and the original applications were go back into 2017. Mm -hmm. okay. So I would I would expect that we would have all of 2019. Okay, uh, all of 2019. 2019 in that. Okay, in that. and do do we have the ability with working with a Lagos to kind of go in and get a sense, uh, working with Marsha to determine what that what what that additional revenue uh, is going to be for us given the existing call base that we've had, let's say, for the last year, year and a half? Correct. That, that's where those estimates that are in the budget came from. Okay. We took existing Medicaid calls from that duration and, and took our, our cost uh, analysis and our what our return was and um, made an educated Yes, and and so just to remind the council what is that what is that dollar amount that we have put into the budget? Uh, I that brought that. Yeah, uh, five hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars this year, because well, I'm sorry, on the ambulance side, and three hundred twenty-two thousand dollars. That's not for the eighteen nineteen fiscal year, but that's for the back. Okay. Uh, retro as well as the fiscal year. Okay, and so Marcia, that's the back, the top of your head, and then that's remember? and this is 2019. Okay. What right. budget line item is that? That's under uh, revenues uh, for ambulance under um, 4555, and and in fire revenues also. Great. Could I ask a question? This was this came up some time ago where we added 9,000 Medicaid recipients. Why the big jump? I 
Um, How many do we have now? I mean, well, I honestly don't know that Chief Mount's the one that would have that number off the top of his head. He works with them closely. 9,000 was a significant increase in the county compared to where we were. Uh, and a result of having that um, uh, ability to have someone pay for your medical beer, bill. Um, if I had someone pay for my medical beer, that'd be great. But um, <laughs> medical bill, uh, the, the, the use went up. And, and so um, there are a lot of uninsured um, individuals within the county. Um, and, and then when, when they got the insurance, they tended to use oh, the services. The there was the Medicaid insurance. for the, uh, And I'm using the term loosely because there's like five or six different types of, uh, of Medicaid, uh, whether it's through the clearinghouses or the, uh, or the county okay. group. Okay, I, I get it now. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Um, and, and again, I know we're in this discussion and, and thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as we're going through the budget, sometimes, you know, we're, we're looking at all thousand pages of the budget. Right. Right. Um, um, I, I know that we are, um, close to coming to an agreement on how to approach the specialty care facilities and that additional right. fee is that in our numbers here okay yes sir so just bring that up when we go to, to that chief if I you will. would yep um for those of you that aren't familiar with how we staff i've talked about it a lot but this is just kind of an overview of, of what our daily staffing looks like um and as uh, in in one shift we have an extra person currently so they will have that 12 um, and, and as, as the vac vacancies occur, once that person is uh, cleared to operate independently, um, we would, if there were a vacancy, we, we would slide them to cover for that vacancy. Uh, right now, it's a new position. Right now, it's a new position. We haven't had the opportunity to get them up, uh, cleared to operate independently, so we can't really take advantage of them to put them in that in that role at this point in time. Um, the the engine is the is the vehicle um, that. Um, uh, the staff comes off of in order to give people time off. So we allow two people off um, at any one time per shift, not counting sick leave uh, or illnesses or FMLA or injuries or um, that type of stuff. So for scheduled vacation, uh, they're allowed two off. We run with a minimum staffing of nine, um, and then those two come off of the engine. If at any time uh, there's a fire call while that engine's in the station, one of the ambulances is assigned to jump over to the engine, so we go out the door with four. If they're not in the station and they're available outside the scene, they would meet the engine on scene and, and provide those four. If they are not available, the engine's supposed to wait in station until we get volunteers. And that's kind of how we're operationally responding right now. Just, just to to clarify, as we're looking at that screen, um, our 24-hour staff, um, DC one, is is that uh, is that one of the vehicles that uh, the battalion chief would be in to go? Right. And then engine one, you say, is the the, and that we'd have a lieutenant. We would have a driver. Okay, a driver, and then two fire up fires. up to two officers if they're available. Correct. 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 Okay. And then M1 is a medic med unit. Okay. And medic 10 is a medic unit. Medic 12 is a medic unit at the at the Baker Creek station. Okay. okay. Now Monday through Friday we have the two part timers um, in Amity. Okay. But then that's not. This is the full time staffing that deals with our fire response specifically. Okay. Okay. So where are we at right now? Um, we have employee retention challenges, uh, and I'll get into that a little bit. We have call volumes continue to increase. We have mandatory overtime uh, challenges within the organization due to our staffing levels. Uh, we have staffing challenges both with paid and volunteers. Uh, we have a lack of additional stations that, that gives us challenges with our, our response times in North and Southeast. Um, which in, talks about our fire response times not being met and we're not meeting our critical staffing for fires. Um, this is a, a snapshot of the last four years of the transition that we've experienced within the department. Um, the departments on the right are the successful winners uh, of our employees as they, um, have the, as they moved on to uh, other departments. Um, if you'll notice, 95% um, of those departments are not providing ambulance service. Um, they're they're fire-based, fire, not fire-based EMS um, departments. Uh, and the couple with asterisks are, are ones that, that um, 
did not go to another department. They decided to resign and move on. So they went into another career or another field? Or? Correct. Okay, correct. Uh, so that put us at, uh, if you count for me, is that 16 in four years? Uh, uh, vacancies within the organization. So when we start talking about um, the challenges that we face internally, um, we, those types of vacancies in a department of 32 over four years puts us at 50% of our employees or less than four years in, um, within our organization. Um, once we have the, we have three new hires coming in the door that should be in place by October 15th. Uh, once that occurs, we'll have 10 employees on, on probation or within one year of their start date. Mm -hmm. um, significant concern and risk to um, our citizens in the field when we start talking about paramedic care and services that we're providing outside. So retention is, is a concern with us. It's, with, it's a concern with me. It's a concern on the, uh, from our citizens on the, on the issues that we are trying to accomplish. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that, we're, that I get that um, out there. Um, aside from the risk assessment concern that's out on the field, uh, every new employee costs us about $77,000 in costs. Um, so if we take a look at the 16 that we had over the last four years, that's about $1.2 million in costs associated with our retention challenges. So whatever we can do to uh, work through the retention issues, not only does it reduce our risk and reduces our workload stress with, uh, for the employees within the organization, but it also reduces our costs overall. Um, and we can start finding those ways to, to uh, improve our retention within the organization. Of, of any of our new hires, and you may have addressed this, any of those lateral or are they all new out of training? And well, um, One is a lateral from Florida, or from Florida, from um, um, Arizona. Okay. Currently a paramedic firefighter working in Arizona that will be transitioning up here. One is a uh, three-year four-year paramedic working for um, AMR in, in Multnomah County up in Portland. So pretty used to consistent high volumes and paramedic decision making in the field. Uh, and then one of them uh, is a new paramedic, but he's been working as an uh, intermediate uh, EMT in Marion County for several years and making conscious patient care uh, information at a, a little lower level than the, um, a little lower, but a lower level than the, than the paramedic level. So um, I, I, I think two of them are, are, won't take five months to get up and running. It might be two or three months. Um, one of them may take a little longer. And thus, the, 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 big, the big impact is going to be on the training time, uh, a cutting down in the training time if they're coming in uh, fully trained or almost fully experienced and trained. Right. So our, our, our challenge is um, um, n none of these uh, individuals are working under our medical protocols currently. Okay. We use metro area protocols, but Portland is not uh, part of the metro area. They're Portland protocols. Um, so, so they're similar, but they're not the same. So when someone's been working in, uh, in an area where the protocols are different for a while, it takes some, uh, some rememorization and, and some uh, work to get them back into some of those areas. So that's, we're cautious about uh, just putting people into the field and running with it. Um, our, our training program 15 years ago, 20 years ago was go forth and conquer, ride. Make sure you're doing good. Don't let them hurt anybody. That's great. Good job. And I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it was, we have a very formalized training program now to make sure that we're managing the, the new employees uh, transition into our organization and our protocols and, and procedures. And some of that takes more time, but it also eliminates risk and, and sets us up for the long run for a more successful employee. If it is a lateral move and they do have like three or four years of experience, does that co cut the cost in half or quarter it? Or? I, no, it wouldn't be half because we still have to do all of the testing up front, all of the all of the psychological background, all of those things that cost a significant amount. We still have to buy them the turnouts. The only reduced amount of time, uh, they still have to spend the time in our academy, which is a week worth of overtime for several people, instructors, as well as, as the, the applicants. Um, the reduction down is the shift coverage for a month or two, um, which is... I mean, it's it's it can be five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, but it's not it's not going to drop that seventy seven thousand dollars to twenty thousand. The vacancy itself, um, when someone walks out the door, we have um, a, depend, if we have a list established, which we do currently, um, it's a, it's a two month window to get them in the door, and then it's a three to four month window to get them on the seat in the seat up and running, and the overtime coverage or the shift coverage for those is is where the significant cost comes from. A couple questions. So 
uh, with that savings that we'd have in the fire service, is it common practice like in the police service to offer signing bonuses for lateral lateral transfers and not get such green employees? It's not I, the most fire services uh, departments that I'm aware of um, offer the opportunity f and, and we do that as well. If you're a lateral employee, we'll give you credit for the years that you have worked and bring you in at a higher wage within our current scale. Um, we, we, we do not, and I'm not aware of, I'm familiar with what our police department's doing, but I'm not aware of uh, anyone that is, is offering the opportunity uh, for cash for coming in the door. That doesn't mean it's something, not something we should explore. And, and Chief Scales and I have talked a little bit about that uh, because it could reduce our costs that down. Um, and that might be a, a, a way we can look at doing that. And then other question was on that uh, retention uh, chart that you showed us. Mm -hmm. It tracked like three and 15, three and 16, four and 17, and I believe uh, seven and 18 or six and 18. As far as how that's trending gives me pause and concern, but in the years previous since you've been here, um, <clears throat> were we averaging about three a year? Is that kind of standard for what our department's seen for the about decade that you've been around? Or so. Departments our size, uh, or similar departments that run operations like we do, and the the ones I'll show you in just a little bit. But those departments trend at one or two a year, more likely two. Smaller departments, um, uh, two. Larger departments, one maybe. Corvallis and Albany, once in a while, they lose one a year, um, but they're not uh, transition departments. They're not. People aren't going there to get trained and go somewhere else, and and they have enough. Um, they have enough. I want to say downtime, but they have enough time off of the ambulances uh, to ride engines where they get a break from the increased workload of the ambulance service. So um, those departments are more successful in retaining people um, as far as as far as that goes. Um, the smaller ones tend to lose um, a couple of year to the larger metropolitan areas um, looking for um, um, other opportunities or that the ambulance work. Um, Lebanon is a, similar to us as far as uh, w staffing and workload. They're not, they're not as busy as us, but um, they're, they're similar. They have some of the same retention challenges, but their numbers are lower than ours, than ours as far as the transitioning out. Prior to 15, uh, we were in an economic downturn, and there wasn't a lot of hiring going on by the larger metropolitan areas. We did lose two or three a year, um, um, but it wasn't uh, anything as, as significant as we're experiencing currently. Okay. And uh, last questions. I believe I know the answer to this, but just to clarify, on that staffing chart you showed us with uh, Engine 1, you had an LT and AO and two firefighters, and when two staff members come off, it's always the two firefighters, right? The the AO is always the AO. That's an assigned position. That's that a is, lateral that is a, position in the organization. Correct. That's a promotion. Correct. Okay. The the battalion chief, the lieutenant, and AO are one per shift paid uh, job descriptions. Um, the Now, if one of those are off, other individuals that are trained and qualified can move into there uh, and fill in for them with um, with a, a stipend for the shift. But um, those those are job descriptions and, and paid positions. They don't come off of the rig unless a significant issue is, is developed. They're, most of them are paramedics. So if something did happen, we had to use them in some, or they do work back and ride ambulances. Um, but the the during the day, the more than likely, they'll be on that engine. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chief? Sure. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Back to the retention. I'm glad Adam went back there. I had a question on that. Uh, is there a correlation or, or not a correlation between the number of lack of retention moving over to those departments that don't have ambulance service? Is there a... You had, you had mentioned there's a... Right, a large portion, a large of, the, portion of, of those. portion of those do not have ambulance. To, correct. Um, us, the... the in, um, the workload internally within our organization, because of the number of calls and their staffing levels, um, creates a lot of stress and pressure uh, on the employees. Um, when they have the opportunity to get onto the engine um, and get off of the ambulance for a day, it, it gives them a mental day. They're still going on calls. They're still doing things. They're running just as many calls, but they're not having to write the charts. They're not having to do the, the critical thinking. Uh, and when you're working um, doubles, uh, because of shortages in staffing, that, that creates a significant um, pressure on the employees. So the ambulance creates a, a more of a, a stress level. Uh, yeah, there, there's, there, there's, a, 
there's the perception that the ambulance is is more of a workload, um, and and you can argue it both ways. But I, and I I know for for a fact there's more uh, there's more patient contact, there's more critical thinking that's going on in the ambulance uh, on a regular basis compared to if you're riding backwards in the engine. Uh, if you're riding backwards in the engine, you have a lieutenant or an, at least someone filling in as a lieutenant, uh, giving you directions as, a, as part of the team. When you're on the ambulance, you're out there, you're on your own making critical decisions and, and making life and decisions on a regular daily basis. And that does take a toll. And the physicality of a fire going out on a call right. is, is more than a than the mental, emotional. Well, they're all firefighters. So e even yeah. though they're, the ambulance is, is out there doing that, that mental critical thinking process on a, all day long, then there's a fire. Now they're going to a fire to assist the folks that are on the back of the engine also pull hose. Yeah. So they're still, they're still doing both jobs. They're just getting there in a different vehicle. Yeah. Okay. Chief, I have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, so for the reimbursement, how, uh, is that once you have applied for that once, is it a given that you will, like, is it something that can be relied upon? And how, do, how? So, so the, re so what will, in my best educated guess, what will occur is there'll be an application process for the city of McMinnville Ambulance Service to become a provider with uh, DHS in this process. Mm -hmm. um, will it have to be a Medicaid? Come back later. Come back later. <laughs> yeah, we're The, the DHS uh, will, I mean, we, we are a Medicaid provider or a Medicare provider, uh, so we will qualify as a provider with, with DHS for this reimbursement. Um, once once we have an application on file, uh, then we will annually submit for a reimbursement on the calls that we responded to that year, show our costs per call, and, and then and show them the amounts, and then they will cut us a check. I'm simplifying that, but... Uh, at the end of the day. So um, this this reimbursement process um, for, for federal reimbursement through the Medicaid program has been in place well before um, the ACA, well before all the <coughs> other new, new recent changes to health care at right. the federal level. So this is nothing new. It's just that the first time that the, the uh, ambulance services are taking advantage of it. So we're, we're c pretty confident that it's not it's going to stay around in it, the it, form that's... Uh, it's we, we hope. Um, there's no guarantee that anything is at the at the federal level is going to stay the same. Right. But it has been a consistent ac um, um, funding source for hospitals for uh, for many years uh, before the 2002 changes. Well before well before a lot of those changes that occurred back in in 2002. Okay. And then the other question I had is: there obviously are a, a significant number of fire departments that don't have the ambulances. How do they fund? If, General they fund be? taxes. So they just pay the higher price and Correct. don't. Okay. Correct. Uh, they they do have. Uh, I mean, Portland has huge amounts of charges for fire inspections and permits and those types of things. Mm -hmm. they, but that supplements their prevention program or their or their inspection programs. Um, most of the departments are are based primarily on general fund uh, support um, through their taxing of their district. They're uh, they're uh, the larger metropolitan area, except for. City of Portland, are and Hillsborough are um, are districts, and um, and some of those larger districts are running at two oh seven, uh, two dollars and seven cents per thousand uh, of of tax. That's what Newburgh is now paying as a result of being um, annexed by um, by Tuolumne Valley. Mm -hmm. um, the the cost spread over the larger population, uh, including some of the the corporations that are within Washington County, uh, make it a sustainable model for Tuolumne Valley. Um, and, and for Clackamas and for many of the other districts. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but a large uh, 53 departments in the last two years have gone away within the state of Oregon. And when I say gone away, uh, there's still a fire department there. They're still operating, but they have merged, consolidated, or created new districts um, for the benefit of the the whole. Like um, you were talking about correct. possibly doing correct. it. Correct. Absolutely. Districts. And Probably a big motivation for that is because of the financial model. Right. The, the, the fire departments, um, given the current tax law within the state of Oregon, are, are um, um, competing, if you're in a municipality, competing for tax dollars to sustain yourself. Um, the sustainable fire department districts that are out there currently are around the $2 per thousand model. Uh, we're currently using about a dollar fifty of the general fund dollars to to sustain our operations. So um, the challenges that we're facing, while uh, and I'm not saying they're staffing or they're substations, or it's all revenue challenge. 
and the challenges that we're facing are, um, are, by, are by nature that we're a full service municipality and that we have um, the, the tough time unless you levy or bond to, to get those additional resources in um, and, and that's not necessarily a sustainable model. It'd be a good stopgap and a bridge to move into a district because then that could be assimilated by the district uh, rates. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I, we already covered that. Chief, can I have, can yes, I have ask a couple yes, of questions? I just want to make sure that I have my kind of head straight on this. Um, so we have significant retention problems, um, or have had the last few years. And year. as near as I can tell, just from your testimony and hearing from folks, that it seems to me that it's primarily built around not enough time on the engine, not enough billet space for people, and then a staffing level that's too low to meet the, the current demand on the, on the workforce. Is that is that does that capture most of the concerns that you've heard raised? Right, correct. So, uh, there are other internal challenges, but those are the primary ones. Um, one of the one of the concerns and issues is training opportunities for our employees, and that includes succession training, um, officer officer training, succession planning, uh, the ability for the firefighters that have been, have been here more than a year to get other training opportunities within the organization. The problem that we have is when you have 10, 10 employees or three per shift that are on probation, almost all of your training time is spent on probationary training, uh, getting the new employees up to speed. And, and as you can see, the rotation of, of 15, 16, 17, no, no shifts have had the opportunity to work on advanced training opportunities. And that is a, is a, that, that's a psychological problem and because you want to be able to prove yourself at work. And when we're not able to afford those opportunities without forcing the, them to do it off duty uh, because we can't provide the internal time on time because they've got to spend that time training their probationary employees. So that, that's a side note, but it's just one of those things that stacks on to, to the challenge. Um, and, and so the, Firefighter uh, time off and overtime and shift coverage and, and mandatory uh, coverage. Um, so our average firefighter last year used uh, 12 and a half shifts per person uh, to take the time off. Uh, that was with 33 employees. Um, the average firefighter last year had to work back nine shifts. So um, in order to get those 12 shifts off, ultimately there's individuals that are working nine shifts so that other people can have time off. Um, and a lot of that is a result of our vacancies. It's not, they're not working back to cover vacations and holidays. They're working back to cover all the other reasons that we have time off assist aside from the vacations. But when you look at every 33 employees working nine doubles, um, that, that's a, that's like almost I don't want to exaggerate, but that's one every nine months, or not a, that's nine months out of the year that someone's working a double. And more than likely, 75% of our, or 60% of our employees uh, are covering the majority of that. So if I were to really break it down, there's two or three employees that do not work a lot of overtime uh, to cover. So um, there, the, the more, nine is, is not really what's really happening. There are people out there working a couple of month uh, doubles because there's not everyone is willing to work that overtime because they're, they're just tired and, and, and spent. So, um, so that, that is really um, the shift coverage, the mandatory holdover, the overtime issues that, that we face are really one of the, the larger components of um, the stress that's happening within our organization currently. Yeah, so as we take a look at that retention schedule and see how much um, movement we've had in 2018, it just adds to this problem. That's correct. That's it's right. it's a it's a spiral that goes down and down, and there's no there's I mean there's light at the end of the tunnel, but it's it's down the road when you're taking a look at uh, certifications, training, and all those things right. that need to come back yeah. up. And and and, and yeah, to be fair, um, given the the the, um, the dynamic that we're in within our organization currently, it's very difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah when you're when you're having to to work that 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 double the next day and that that's that's one of the challenges that we're facing okay so if i can mayor yeah um so in terms of the constraints that you're operating under financially um as near as i can tell the medicaid reimbursement rates are a substantial constraint obviously from what you've been telling us 
um, we have limited general fund resources. Are those primarily the two main main constraints that you have um, in terms of financial resources, or are there other ones that are kind of major drivers? The, the majority of the financial resources I don't have control over, and my creativity is uh, is handcuffed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> whether it's by state law or um, or by the by the fact that we're actually a full service city and and we're not a district, and, and I don't have the uh, the ability to to do some of the things that we could do uh, as a district. So, so, but those are the those are two among the correct. Main, the yeah. general fund support is a is a challenge for us, um, and and the well uh, um, since two thousand two, the 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 returns off of the ambulance billing have been um, reduced uh, from what they were in prior. Time. I, they'll never return, yeah. uh, so I, I wouldn't. There's no, I don't believe there's anything that. Uh, but other your than costs the, have gone up and the reimbursements correct. have gone up. Correct. Down. Okay, yep. and and so. What it sounds like from what you've been saying for some time is that your solution is to regionalize both fire and ambulance services and that that by raising the raising the assessment across these multiple jurisdictions that this will enable us to kind of address a lot of these issues. So do we have a sense of like what what kind of time scale are we looking at and what can we do to try and move that situation forward because it sounds like you have you know people who have been frustrated for a long time and who have a big workload and you know i, I guess i guess my view is that whatever we can do to start moving towards that vision I, i'd like to see so yes <laughs> skip over slides. Okay, all right. Sorry. Can you sorry. hold that thought for just one minute? And let me. I want to share this slide, and then I'll go right into what you're talking about. Thank I, you. I'm just yeah, getting ahead of myself. Um, how do we compare? Uh, because one of the first things that we do as a human being uh, is, is to take a look out the window and see um, w w what does it look like for my friend that works over here or my friend that works over there, and how many do they have versus how many do we have, and how the, what the heck is going on? And, and let me be quite frank. I, don't, I do not believe that um, I mean everyone would like a raise, but uh, I, I, I do not believe that our internal challenges are based on our salary schedule at all. It, re it really is is, uh, and I'm, I'm I mean I'm speaking out of turn, but I really believe it has to do with our working conditions, our workload, and and uh, and the challenges that we're facing internally, because um, uh, we're we're relatively competitive uh, in our wage wage scales. Uh, we're not. When I first got here, we weren't. But over the last ten years, council has brought us up and and brought made uh, brought us up into com into a much more uh, uh, competitive uh, wage scale. So um, th that has been a success for us. Um, but that obviously um, there's other things besides money uh, in the, in this world. So how do we compare? Uh, this is these are 2017 numbers. So so forgive me, I don't have uh, current numbers. Um, but you know, if we look at um, Albany and and um, Corvallis in particular, um, we're running just shy, shy of uh, Albany's call volume and uh, more than Corvallis's call volume, and we're running 50% of Albany's uh, staffing to run those calls, and we're running whatever that percentage is of Corvallis's uh, to run those calls. So when we're talking about the lack of transition that occurs in Albany and Corvallis, it, it, it's not so much the calls, but it's the number of calls per person and uh, and and having the opportunity to get off of the engine and on an engine and, and do those things um, that still contribute to the service levels of the organization, but give you that break uh, within within the department, sir. Does each city comp up there, do they do fire and EMS? Those? Correct. Every one of those provides fire-based EMS within their community, and most of them provide it to a district like we do on the outside. We, we have different sizes. So Albany, um, you know, maybe getting closer to 60,000 in population as compared to our 33, 34. Uh, so they have, um, they have a bigger pie of... Uh, well, well, we also have the rural district, which adds another 10 to ours. So, okay. um, so that's uh, one of those things that, I mean, they're okay. contributing their tax dollars into our, sure. our department that helps uh, go to sustain the ambulance operations also. So that puts us up to the 43, 44 range. Okay. So that's, that's kind of why those are in that list. There's some that are smaller, some that are larger, a little larger, but at, they're, they're three or four above and three or four below. So that's kind of what we're looking at. But as we take a look at this, we can we can ascertain that that 
having that number of FTE is really coming out of general funds. Absolutely. They, they, they built, they've built a model that they've been able to put more money into uh, fire and safety yes. over time. Correct. Okay. Correct. So, so in McMinnville, uh, we started out with a completely all-volunteer fire department, um, as probably most of these departments did. But they started transitioning to full-time FTE firefighters well before McMinnville did. We relied very heavily on volunteers all the way into the late 80s. Uh, we still rely very heavily on volunteers. I don't mean to say that we don't. Um, but as, as far as primary first responders, we still rely very heavily on volunteers for our fire response. And both of these departments uh, obviously do not, given the number of the, they have volunteers volunteers, but they're in a much different structured environment. Our volunteers, our second out engines, our truck company, our squad are all volunteers. Um, routinely, um, we don't get all those units on fires right. because of the, the nature of our volunteer uh, core as it sits currently. And this is not to bash the volunteer. Please don't take it as that. It is, it is the nature of the, of, the, of the challenge that we're facing as a combination department. So those departments um, started earlier on using general fund dollars to build fire. And then as EMS came on and supplemented uh, revenues, they, they moved along. Whereas we um, kept uh, our volunteer response quite some time uh, on fire and just used the ambulance dollars to pay, buy people. And that's how we built our department. So that's kind of why we're a little bit behind the power curve on some of that. Some of those organizations have larger tax bases. I'm, I'm not arguing that that point by any means. Um, I get that, um, but it just it just is one of those things that as you look out the window and see how your neighbor's doing, that's some of the stuff that we're seeing and some of the things that we're 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 worried about. Of the 8,038 calls we ran last year, how many of those calls were? Um, I don't know what term you'd want to use, but basically bed tax calls. Like how many of those calls do we want to try and change the behavior with that bed tax and so bed fee? The, the number of calls that we anticipated in 2017 that, um, well, uh, 1,700 calls, I think, is 37% of our in-city calls were care home calls. Um, now, the... the um, if you're looking at the um, the um, fee for misuse of 911, um, that that fee uh, we we estimated at 500 last year. <coughs> okay. Um, so options for the future. We've already started going down the road of talking about partnerships, leveraging partnerships. We were in uh, pretty significant conversations with Newberg before the um, uh, transition to the Tualatin Valley um, partnership. We were moving down the road with Sheridan before they kind of took a step back and, and are, are now they're moving successfully uh, towards a partnership with uh, West Valley, which makes sense uh, regionally. Um, it doesn't mean that we're out of the conversations with them. It's just we need to let them finish their their conversations on the West End and get that model in place before we can move there. So that takes time and it takes it, it takes time for them to get there and it takes time for us to do things we need to do. Um, you're all aware, but for those in the audience, we have uh, contracts with Amity. Um, I have a meeting with Amity's Rural District Board in um, October talking about timelines for administrative um, contract to take over administration of, of Amity's department um, for the retiring Bruce Hubbard. Um, that would hopefully take place in July. Um, the, the moves that we're making with Amity, the moves that we're making with Lafayette, uh, Lafayette is still looking at going to a bond for a substation. It's been revised. Uh, partnerships with Lafayette would be successful in dealing with the North End challenges that we have if it's successful. If it's not successful, McMinnville is still struggling with the North End responses. Um, and we're still struggling with airport responses. Uh, and I say airport, it's not specifically to the airport, but all of those care homes and facilities and residences out on the, on the uh, uh, Highway 18. Um, we have had significant conversations with Dundee, Dayton, Carleton, in addition to Amity and Lafayette, um, on training, administration, and operations. I've spoken with the mayor and city administrators of Dundee. Um, we've spoken with um, board members and, and chiefs of um, all of those departments. Carleton is a is a. We'd like to wait and see how things go. We're not really. We don't want to be a uh, jumping into this with both feet right now. Um, but. The majority of the chiefs and the political bodies that oversee the chiefs are very supportive of moving forward in a um, larger district concept for, for the Yamhill County area. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of the chiefs have uh, uh, said there's been interest 
for quite some time, but they just didn't know how to go about doing it. And they're very supportive of us spearheading it and, and moving forward with it. So we've taken that as we're gonna spearhead it and move forward with it. Um, and while we were in contract uh, negotiations or um, preliminary contract negotiations with Newberg, we contracted with Spear Hoyt and, and specifically Christy Munson um, out of Eugene to lay the groundwork for us on what does it look like for us to move to a district? How do we do that? What are the ways that's successful? She drew us an outline um, and I can make sure that you get a copy of that. I think you may have already seen it, but it lays the groundwork. Administrative like we're doing with Amity, move down the road, create partnerships, develop those administrative contractual oversights um, for uh, administration, training, maintenance, and, and then you start working the functional consolidation where you're responding together and, and working as one department. Um, and then looking at creating the new oversight committee or board that would manage this new department of the three or four governmental entities that are going on. Um, and then at, once you're at that point, the best move would be to move at that point to move to create a district. If you try and create the district before you've gotten to that point, uh, you may get a lot of sour grapes. You may not, and unless you, even if you're an outstanding marketing uh, machine, like our neighbors in, in uh, Washington County, um, it, it would be a challenge if you didn't lay the groundwork and build the relationships in the communities before you went to the vote, um, and as they did with Newburgh with the contract before they before they went into that vote. Um, so that so so, uh, Councilor Peralta, when you were asking me about how long, um, you know, we could be relatively set up within three years to go with Amity, but if we're looking at doing something that's that's four or five departments and a little bigger. We're talking more along the five-year line before we get there. The problem with that is, is all the white pages that I showed you beforehand um, are still out there and those challenges are still there and we need to find that bridge that gets us from uh, from where we are to what our end goal is of the, of the, of the district. Um, and I was asked earlier today in an interview, um, so this, this district potentially could, could be a, um, uh, an end run of the tax rules. And I, I know it's not an end run of the tax rules. I can see how it might be perceived as that. But what it is is finding the, the funding to sustain the fire and EMS operations for not only our city, but our partners uh, well into the future. Mm -hmm. and, and the only way we can do that is to find that new permanent tax rate where it's a guaranteed uh, revenue rather than a five-year levy uh, that you would have to lay off people every if you were not successful in five years. So the, the best model and, and the most successful model has been to create those partnerships, move along, uh, create that oversight committee, and then move to a district vote for those those that are interested in becoming a part of that group. And uh, and it has been successful all over the state uh, in fire operations, not in other areas a lot, but in fire and EMS, it's been relatively successful. And you can tell by the decline of the number of registered fire departments um, within the state of, of Oregon as they consolidate and merge into other districts or create new districts. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm at with questions. Chief. Uh, just a quick question. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, you talked that you you would have more latitude as a district to do certain things. So so the so the the funds that come into the fire department are dedicated to the fire department specifically, whereas the funds that come into the city are a citywide right. resource. That that was the, what I meant by the latitude. The the tax rate I, I don't have any control over. That would be whatever the voters decided to establish. Right. We would come in with a recommended tax rate. Um, one of the successful uh, district partnerships uh, was the city of Redmond fire department and the Redmond rural fire district. They were both at very similar tax rates, um, but they wanted to consolidate and, uh, and, and create, in other words, there was a, a small incremental raise of the new tax rate. Um, and so when, when they went to the vote, um, there were several ballots on the measure. One was dissolve the current district, one was create the new district, one was create the new tax rate for the new district, and then one was the city uh, put on a uh, on the ballot so they could get the support of the city voters that uh, while the city still has the taxing authority, uh, if, if the district takes that dollar fifty that was been given to them out of the city taxes, uh, and that's their new tax rate. The, the city still has the legislative legal authority to tax that. They committed to only do incremental raises or to any significant raises would go back to a vote, even though um, they didn't have to do that, but it was a way that the city uh, voters, uh, to, to get the city voters to buy off on, on that, um, that's, that concept to, uh, to uh, the, new, uh, the new district. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's see, Wendy and then oh, South. Sorry. So, um, Mike, you actually addressed part of my question <clears throat> just then with regards to the vote. You said this is being done all over Oregon, and I wanted to know what has been successful with regards to um, presenting it to the citizens in a way that the districts have been able to get the funds that they would need. Right. So, um, some of the slides that I showed you that are challenges currently, like our response time requirements and 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 the, the inability to meet the, the needs of the citizens on the fire side, um, would be our starting point, and then uh, we would be able to demonstrate what the, this new model would do for us and what this and how that would improve the services to the citizens. You, you need to at least uh, show some sort of improvement to the partners, the voters in in each district, to to be have a successful vote in those districts uh, to do that. Um, and usually you hire a, a, a marketing company to uh, help you through that process uh, as far as marketing the, the information. But, the, but the, the end goal of the, of the larger project would be um, to, to demonstrate that there is a successful um, positive for each of the districts that are becoming, or each of the entities that are becoming a part of this new district. And, and a large part of it would be, um, for example, the, this, the airport um, substation uh, that something needs to occur in that area in order to improve our service levels uh, yeah. to the city of McMinnville uh, and and to and to the residents in the rural district in that area also. Um, so those are the things that you look at as you move forward. And, and so what what does that look like? And where can we place it? And does it actually have to be in the city limits now that we're no longer a city department? Could it be outside the city limits? It could it be in the rural district? Now the rural district gets a significant benefit in their ISO rating, and there's a lot of other things that go along with those things. Okay. We, we bring a lot to the table um, as an organization, as the largest uh, department and the largest municipality within the organization. We also bring a lot to the table as our tax base is the largest in sure. the group of the people that we're talking about. So the, the challenges that we have are to make sure that, that the move forward is equitable to the citizens of McMinnville. Uh, there is going to be an improved service to the citizens of McMinnville as a result of that, but also that those opportunities for the, the districts that are coming a part of this new thing uh, get those get some measure of improvement in what they're getting also. And do they in the uh, the areas that have done this that you're familiar with? They do they generally get the vote support um, the first time most I, of the time, I, or I, is it the majority more? of the time of when these. Um, when these have done well, even when there's an organized opposition, uh, if the marketing and the and the the plan is is delivered to the public appropriately, um, that has been successful. There have been failures. I'm not going to say there's not. Most of the failures I've seen have been in levies and bonds, not in consolidating districts and creating new districts. The consolidation of multiple agencies into one. Um, in, in many people's world is a good thing because you're reducing a bunch of government entities into one government entity. So there's there's those that philosophically think that one is better than eight, um, but you also have the advantage, the inherent advantage of, um, of um, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I'm going too long, I'm rambling. Uh -huh. um, economies of scale. Right. And, and while e each of these seven departments has a paid fire chief, um, each of these seven departments has a reserve fire engine. Uh, when you have when you have seven fire departments and you need three reserve fire engines at three or four hundred thousand dollars an engine instead of seven reserve engines at three or four hundred thousand dollars an engine, it, it doesn't. It's not a it's not a savings up front, but in the long run of the operation of all of the organizations, there's an overall reduction yeah. when you take the dollars associated with. Um, the chief's positions, and you now are providing administrative oversight of those departments um, according to their board and their policies and their wishes and beliefs, but the contract allows for those dollars to come into the system and, and pay for training officers. So not only McMinnville is better, but the, the rural districts are better also. And, and those are the ways you can leverage some of those things, but at the long run, it really is about establishing a permanent tax rate that can sustain the operations of the organization. Well, and that becomes a, a, a big consideration because some of these um, these fire departments outside of the city, they may not be putting in the same amount of, of, of capital in. Uh, and I'm guessing as we took a look at, you know, I think with uh, Spear and Hoyt, when they went and looked at the partnership, that was a part of the, the funding bases, right? And right. were we at the higher end or were we right in the mix with everyone else? With, with Newburgh? 
Well, with uh, and I guess that was with Newburgh, but sure. we've done some studies with the the valley, so to speak. Right. And right. are we situated pretty evenly with the other, like Amity, uh, um, Dundee? As far as their millage rate, yes. Uh, Amity's already at over two with okay. Um, okay. with their uh, levy and a bond. Okay. Um, so they're but so that's with their their bond also. Right. But, which... but if we came in at two, that would assimilate that into that, okay. and then and then that that would maintain as their permanent tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the West Valley, I believe, are in the dollar seventies okay. range. So um, higher than us. Uh, so they're they're a little higher than us. The rural districts are lower than us that that don't have fire chiefs or that that um, have only one fire chief and, and employees are, are are lower. They're in the dollar twenty range dollar range uh, so there's those districts would would um, have an increase in, in rate that was significantly higher R rural Newburgh was at 47 cents and now they're at two dollars plus yeah um, so but they voted for it um, the so the, their the marketing job and and the, the and the service improvements and and there was commitment I believe to to deal with a substation and in, in their area further on into the future. Um, so there were there were some issues that you work out through the process in order to try and get a successful vote uh, in the back end. One of uh, Council Peralta asked me a question about what we need now. Uh, one of the things that I I don't have um, and I, I'm I, this is a work session so I'm not trying to pitch dollars and cents but uh, one of the things that I, I will be coming back uh, and you'll see in, in our budget for next year um, is a consultant to come in and build us a roadmap um, we w I could use the administrative support to help me build the roadmap so we can we can lay the groundwork and start setting up some of those things that we need we are doing it um, as lined out by uh, Spear and Hoyt with with Amity and Lafayette but what we're talking about is something that is going to require a little more administrative support than I have uh, capacity for. So you'll probably see some requests for some funding to, to help me uh, move in that direction in the next budget cycle. We're still talking three to five years for, for a vote. Um, and we're still talking what do we do in the meantime to deal with the issues that were challenged. So Yeah, that, that actually re leads right into my question, Chief. So, um, so you said basically, optimistically, five years maybe right. for, for a, for right. a regional solution and that we need some um, changes in the meantime to act as a bridge to that five-year period. And so just from what I've heard so far, some of those bridges include a bed fee um, at the uh, senior care facilities that would, um, in theory, reduce their utilization and then increase the reimbursement that would happen. And then the second thing that I've heard is that we're going to get a partial Medicaid reimbursement um, that will retroactively um, take effect. At this point, we don't know exactly how much. We've got a possible Lafayette expansion. What's the timeline for that? Um, I I have not had a chance to catch up with their city administrator. I'm not certain if it's going on this ballot or marches. Okay. So I, I don't honestly know. I have a council meeting. I'm going to the council meeting for them in October. Okay. Um, but I have not had a chance to catch up with their city, city administrator this last week. And then, and then a consultant to facilitate the process for the roadmap. Is there anything else in the sense of a bridge during that five-year period that you can think of that we should, that we should be aware of or thinking about? As, as far as revenue specifically? as far as anything um we need to deal with our retention challenges because um in five years we won't have a fire department if we don't do something to address those issues and i don't, I don't mean that uh i mean they mean that tongue-in-cheek but if we continue down the road we're going to be it's going to be very difficult to continue to provide services where we're at so um and, and i don't have an answer uh, and i don't want to I, I need 12 people. That's not um, sure I do, but that's not what I'm here to ask for. I'm here to let you know that I need additional revenue support to sustain us uh, until we can get to the vote. Um, what that looks like, I don't have dollars and cents or, or personnel requests. Um, Could you tell us these other agencies or other fire departments that have like 66 people in their department? Right. How many people did they start adding? I mean, if they've got that many paid staff, how did they do it? Have you looked at those at all? Just out of curiosity, how they approach that. Uh, oh, adding staffing? Yeah. Uh, I, I honestly couldn't give you an answer. I know most staffing additions are done either with an addition of a station 
um, as a new department expands into a new area uh, or a department expands into a new area, then, then staffing goes along with that station. So were they traditionally they do it using levees or something like that to expand their stations? And well, bonds to build bonds the new stations, bonds yes. To the bonds station. to build the new stations. But they wouldn't be used for operations. Uh, I'm not familiar. Uh, I'm not familiar if any of the, either of those two departments are using levees to support their fire service or not. I couldn't speak to that. Okay. Just curious. So, yeah, real, just, before we go on, I just need a, a, a vocabulary correction. There, there are no bed fees. Um, what's coming before the council is a specialty business license. I apologize, council. As well as that. charges for nuisance calls. Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I'm not clear on that second one. Misuse of 911. There we go. Misuse of 911 <laughs> charges. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for correcting my your, your your language. Uh, uh, Chief, what uh, on that slide that compared the different municipalities? Uh, can you address? I know we've heard we've had some conversations about the um, some of the reasons I think why we're so high compared to our population base in calls. Uh, can you just go over what you've experienced? Obviously, we have a l um, large number of care homes population correct so um, within our city limits the care home population uh, we have and I don't have the exact numbers but I think we have a thousand fifty four beds um, they create thirty seven percent of our call volume so um, thirty five thousand people that There's alone is could make up for the difference like we're we're similar to Corvallis which has a much higher population base <laughs> they don't have as high of call well, volumes. Well, they have care homes also. So I mean, we're not unique in care homes, but I, I think we're a little higher in uh, some of the misuse that our care homes do here. Um, and we may have more per population than they do. I, I don't know their number of care homes. Care home challenges are not unique to McMinnville um, and, and, the, and the challenges that care homes bring to the local municipal services, um, which is why the specialty license and, and the, the, to start with. And then um, we have uh, worked diligently um, with the care home management staff of all of the facilities. Um, and care home industry has a um, highly um, um, transient um, management staff. We will go in and meet, meet with a, a care home manager and explain to them our challenges, um, meet with a, the charge nurse, explain to her or him our challenges um, for three weeks. We have a great turnout. Things drop off. Everything's being taken care of. We get about three weeks worth of complaints from staff, our staff, about all of a sudden we're being misused again. We go back and we find out what's going on. Oh, well, we got a new nurse in and, and that's how things are going now. And Or we got a new manager in. And we went out to um, Pacifica um, one day, met with a new executive who had been there for three months, um, had the conversation, had the nurse, met with the nurse that he was working with. Uh, and then um, three months later, um, all of a sudden our call volume shooting back up at Pacifica. And we go back out to talk to the gentleman who we thought was the manager and he's gone. Uh, so, so our challenge has been like a dog chasing our tail. Um, in, in 2000, 12, I believe it was, uh, the state recognized the issues that, that care homes were bringing and the, and the challenges that, that, that you know, ambulances and fire departments were having. And there was a, a large consortium of, of, of people, including the, those from the metro area uh, and the care homes and DHS. And DHS came out with the guidelines for what was expected out of care homes and how to use ambulance services, which is what we're basing our, our ordinance on. Um, and, and those issues continue today and we keep taking that DHS guidelines out with us and educate. Now this is not fair to some of the care homes in town that do a good job. Um, the national average for a care home is one call per bed. Uh, we have care homes in town that are uh, uh, per year, one call per bed per year. We have care homes in town that are running well over three calls per bed per year. Um, that's the side of the coin that we're trying to address with the misuse of 911 fee. Um, and, and then the fact that, that care home as a business, um, whether they're uh, compliant and doing all the things they should or shouldn't do uh, does take advantage of city resources above and beyond the normal businesses. And that is where the specialty license comes in. Right. 
it's good. Well, there's one other piece, and I think we saw that at our last council meeting, and that is we have an aging population that's not in care homes too. I, I, I think, you know, that summary that Jeff gave us showed that there's an aging population. There's a, a real retirement client, clientele in McMinnville, and there's going to be more calls for that um, mm -hmm. segment of the population. Right outside of care home is is another thing that I see right. and, and that will what that will do is as as our demographic shifts yeah. um, as those of us that are in that baby boomer realm get further and further into the um, the baby boomer realm um, <laughs> those numbers are going to go up just like they did with Medicaid uh, as, as the, the the demographic shifts to a higher elderly group our call volume will, will go up and there's, and that is just one of those things that we know going forward that we should be planning for now and 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 uh, so as it does occur we're, we're prepped and ready to go into and ready to provide those services yeah Sal additional questions that the only other question I had is just maybe for a follow-up would you be willing to just I don't want to create extra work for you but you have Albany Canby Kaiser Le Lebanon fire Columbia and Corvallis mm -hmm. would you be willing to just um, pull together the uh, the uh, assessments on those uh, the, the letters their, their the tax bill? rates yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you sure certainly Adam so that was my leading question, so thank you, Sal. Um, my next question was slide 29, the uh, cost of, of new employees. What's the actual cost of one uh, full-time FTE? Salary and wages and benefits. Yeah, everything. Uh, paramedic, firefighters, uh, starting salary, wage and benefits, $129,000. Okay. Um, and then slide eight. It talks about fire response and uh, how we're not meeting that. Yes. What, between now and when we could have a, a larger district in five to seven years, um, optimistically, what could we do to get those, those numbers up to at least, I don't know, I would think maybe around the 75% range would be right. Too, too significant. <laughs> issues affect that 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 number uh, one is that we run our primary fire apparatus on EMS assist calls so because that apparatus is tied up assisting EMS calls that are of higher nature which are required by us by mm -hmm. by state law and by our, our um, ASA um, the, when we're tied up on an EMS call that delays our response getting to the scene with that first out engine our first out engine when, when staffed um, and not and not staffed as a volunteer engine is 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 fine in our responses within the core. The secondary issue is the the response location that we're coming out of the highest traffic corridor in McMinnville, and uh, it's a challenge for us. And we can't get uh, the the zones. And I didn't put that in here, and I apologize. But the southeast zone and the northwest corridor out. Or the north quarter out near the industrial zone, um, both of those are lower than that 49% because of the travel time uh, from station one. So that leads to slide six. Um, you talked about the Lafayette response time correct, being the same. Uh, would that hold true even for all that new housing development going out in the uh, northwest corridor there? there? Yeah, like Baker Creek and Hill Road. Yeah, so um, that area is going to be underserved regardless of whether we're coming in from um, Lafayette or if we're coming in from the main station. So if, if, if Rich were allowed to reinvent the, um, the fire response model for city of McMinnville, we'd have one out north, we'd have one out west, and we'd have one out by the airport, three substations. Um, we wouldn't have one in the downtown core in the highest traffic corridor of the city. I get the concept behind the, the government uh, complex, but in the world of emergency response, we're better served if we're in the peripheral of the community um, and coming into the core rather than starting in the core and trying to get out. And, and if we were, if I can take station one or sell station one and turn it into some sort of uh, downtown market, or <laughs> and, and create a new station out on the west end, one up on the north end, and one out by the airport. The entire community of McMinnville would be served better and more timely. Thank you. Um, 
As far as capacity to lower the workload for our current uh, <coughs> staff, do we have any capacity to house more staff members per shift to get that call number per <coughs> employee down? We have the capacity to house more staff members per shift currently. Um, because we have, and I, I, quite frankly, I think we have 12 bunks, 11, 12 bunks, and I don't live there, so 13, thank you, 13 bunks. Uh, and we're running at nine per shift. Even with 11, we have 13 bunks per shift. So we have the capacity to do that internally currently, yes. Two, two employees are always out at station 12 for 24 hours. Yeah. So that, that's a, that puts us, that gives more. us that, that freedom space. Okay. Well, Chief, I, I really um, appreciate your thoughts about, you know, putting into the budget a, uh, um, bringing in a third party uh, to, to help us analyze where and what, where we sit, as you indicated. Um, you know, as, as Sal was saying, you know, thoughts for increased revenue. Uh, the one thing we haven't talked much about would be levies and bonds, but I don't know that we'd want to do a bond if, if we're looking at strategically where we're going to place our capitals. <laughs> Right, you know, right. but an operating levy in the interim to get us as a stopgap may be something that we take a look at uh, as we, but to have that study done and really understand where we are today and what is it, what's it going to take to get us to where we need to be may be something really critical. And so I'm, I'm excited to hear that um, we bring in the expertise to help us understand that you know we've done that with our strategic plan we could have done that on our own but we brought in um, consultants to really help us and that you know we're not to the end product yet but we really have a uh, a strong document to help us know where we're going to be going in the next you know um, uh, 15, 20 years, and incrementally it's taking steps to get towards that. So that that feels good and comfortable to me. Um, but again, we, we've talked about from a general fund participation for many years, but we're getting down to some nitty gritties today, right. which is a, a really good dialogue. And it's something as a council, we really need to get our, wrap our heads around, but we have to look at those alternatives. And, you know, you even saying that, you know, having, you know, at the hub of our, our community, a fire station, we've grown tremendously in different ways than we, we, uh, we'd anticipated 20 years ago, well, the next 20 years, we're going to grow in places that we don't even know today because of the urban growth boundary. And if we can expand that, we'll have a, another opportunity to get a glimpse of what that might be looking like. So other, other questions or uh, Alan? Yeah, I had one. Uh, we've been look, we've been looking at that Northwest qu quarter up there for a while now, knowing the expansion that was coming on board. Right. Right. That's going to be a massive area of underserved um, mm -hmm. households, Absolutely. for sure. A uh, great percentage of the city, actually. So, in, in the high school, uh, you know, in the future. Um, but uh, it's something to really give some good thought about. Uh, another thing I had was, since we're in the fact-finding and problem-solving phase right now, is have you ever had any experience with uh, surcharge being, being put on care facilities? for ambulance service? No, I have not. Uh, there are states that allow um, SDCs or impact fees. Um, those are not allowed in this state. So um, not allowed they're in, not allowed, in, 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 not for fire or EMS purposes. They're our, allowed for um, construction and infrastructure purposes, but not for operational costs and charges. Um, so that that is why we looked at the specialty license process. The um, the fee for the 911 misuse is being used currently in this state by Clackamas Fire. So that is something that is currently being used for the care home issues. It's not we're not we're not charging down a an untested path on that one by any means. So you, did I hear you correctly that? In the state of Oregon, we can charge SDC fees for construction of. Well, we the SDC uh, in other states, um, you can use. There can be a, a fire or EMS SDC attached to facilities. Mm -hmm. In this state, we cannot do that. And right, there are no impact fees through the SDC process allowed by state law. So the building permit process that we go through for SDCs can't apply to uh, public safety. Not for SDCs. Those are develop system development charges specifically for Mike and his group. 
All right. Thank you. I, I would like to follow up, Mr. Mayor, uh, in your comment about the um, um, the levy. Uh, what a lot of departments do that are moving down this path do use that levy as yep. the, as the stopgap, knowing that the the new permanent tax rate will absorb that and it will it will go away as a part. But of the we process. need to but we need to know what the end result is going to look like right. before we Correct. go out. To Absolutely, because you'd have a very hard time selling that. But this community uh, could in my mind be supportive of if we if we told the story right. and we really understood where we were going uh we've 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 been very cautious in in coming for extra types of things so uh that's why i brought that up and sal when you talked about an extra revenue we didn't the chief didn't bring it up but it truly is another option but we need to know where we're going before we would go down that path um Apropos of the levy, I just had a couple of questions. Um, is a, is it is it is it, can a levy be applied for the entirety of the fire and ambulance district, or is that only something that could be applied within the city limits? If I'm I'm not a tax expert, but I believe it's restricted to the taxing authority of the body that passes it. Right. That's correct. Um, that's not to say that you couldn't partner with, um, say, McMinnville Rural Fire Protection District and have them also go to their voters for a levy at the same time, but it would have to be voted on. In both jurisdictions? In, in, those, in each of those jurisdictions. We wouldn't have authority to put it out to a vote in the district. Their board would have to do that. So, so that's what I thought. And so my suggestion would be if you're contemplating a levy that you get together a group of interested citizens from both the rural portion of the fire district as well as from the city and that you contemplate doing it in both places. Okay. Well, and it's, tried, it's trying to get that amount of monies that each entities putting in towards fire protection and and knowing where you're going to be going in the long run and those levies i think can can level the playing field but get people accustomed to what it might be co being cost one of the one of the challenges that we face currently given the challenges that we face is that um we know that our end goal is the is the district um but even whether that is successful or not is obviously up to the voters. Mm -hmm. um, but we still have those financial challenges yeah. between now and then, regardless of what it looks like at the end, the right. end picture. Adam, uh, back to our previous conversation. So, if there was two more staff members per shift, what would those staff members be doing that would actually raise that fire response time? And do we have the current apparatus in capacity, not just in bunk space, but actual capacity within our system to raise that response time number? <coughs> so, um, if, uh, if we had how much and where, I'm sorry. Uh, so in the previous number, you said that we had room for two more staff members in bunk space. Right. Outside of bunk space, what would those firefighters be doing that would actually raise that uh, call response time, you know, under six minutes or under... Okay. All right. So, so do we so, have another engine that they'd be riding on, but you don't get another engine with two more firefighters? You need an AO, you need a lieutenant, you right. need... So we have we have a variety of options to do, um, and that's 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 where my creative hat gets comes in. Um, there are there are departments that are using an EMS assist vehicle uh, with with lower levels of staffing to go out and support the ambulances instead of using the five hundred thousand dollar engine chasing them down. They send them out in the Tahoe to assist. So we can still meet our requirements by doing that. So there's an additional staff like you're talking about could be deployed like that. They could be deployed as an alternate engine, uh, cross staffing with an ambulance also. Uh, so that would give us that second engine available within the department if they were available. Um, what that does is that takes that primary engine, the fire engine off of EMS calls, and that would uh, improve our fire response um, to the majority of our district, excluding those that are drive time. E either or using it in that method the the other the other option is it, if we move forward with um a, um a lafayette partnership where that substation is staffed we now have an engine that can be staffed and cross staffed with that kind of staffing in the north end of town and that will take care of those issues on the north end of town also thank you so other questions or dialogue among council for the chief Other than that, I would just like to thank everybody in the audience that came. Absolutely. 
Well, Chief, uh, thorough and, and a, a well presented. Uh, I think it's brought us up to to where we're sitting right now and our level of concern. And and um, uh, this work session is just to, to increase our, our knowledge and understanding. And we'll have other opportunities as we look at the strategic plan, because I know uh, safety and livability is one of the major uh, functionalities of that strategic plan. But I think we've got what we need uh, to get us up to a, a point where, as a council, we can uh, have further dialogue with you. I, I don't know any anything that you'd ask the chief to prepare for for at a later time for us. I, you've got a few assignments. I know South had a, a few questions. Anything that we need to give Just directions a, another to Another PowerPoint staff? would be good. Uh -huh. yeah. We like your PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I'll add some more bling next time. Okay. <laughs> Maybe dancing and <laughs> costumes. Okay. All right. Well, Chief, thank you. Thank you. Um, staff, thank you. I know these are trying times, and, uh, um, you know, as we go through this, and like I say, this strategic plan and our focus uh, is going to allow us to kind of take a, a level playing field and looking and, and where we're going to be going down the road. So, again, thank you. Uh, any other items that uh, any counselors would like to bring up? If not, I'll go ahead and close our meeting. Thank you. Thank you.